when we tell big stories, grand stories, the stories that cover years and, and involve the big situations, we tend to tell those stories in a certain way. For example, if you think about how would you tell the story of World War II, if you're a family member, a son or a grandson or someone came to you and said, please tell me the story of World War II. What you'd probably do is begin by telling the story of the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany after the disastrous Treaty of Versailles. And from there, um, the way that Hitler worked with Mussolini of Italy and eventually Hirohito of Japan and engaged in this grand struggle with the other big figures. Uh, FDR, the man who is so big you only need his initials. Stalin, the leader of the USSR, and, and Churchill, the, the brave uh, leader who led a small island nation to stand up to the might of the German military. This way of thinking about history, of telling history, it's called the uh, great man approach to history. And the fact that it's mostly men is, is a sermon for another time. But uh, for now, it's, it's, that's, that's what we call it, the great man approach. The, and what it's based around is this idea that uh, there are certain people about whom the, all of history just revolves. Men of such indomitable will, almost superhuman in, in their capacity. Men who have just changed reality by just who, being who they are. Uh, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Caesar, Richard the Lionheart, Washington, uh, Lincoln, people like this, people who are just larger than life. And as we look at these people, we tend to see them as these perfect leaders, these amazing leaders. As we turn to scripture, that is not what we see. Well, we, we're going to look at some leaders today in, in scripture, and we'll start with Moses, but we're not going to find this great man approach to history. <clears throat> when we turn to Moses, as I said, he is indisputably important. Uh, it's, it has this fascinating background. He was raised as a, the adoptive son of Pharaoh, raised with a, all the education and privilege that brings. Kills a guard in an attempt to help his people. Then he is an exiled, and he goes off, and he is a sheep, sheep herder, which is about as low on the totem pole, social totem pole, as, as, as high as he had been before. That's how low he was now, being this sheep herder. Does this for 40 years before he is called by God, has a discussion with a burning bush, goes and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And that's what happens. The people are freed. Moses triumphant leads the people into the wilderness, uh, going through the Sea of Reeds. A common mistranslation is the Red Sea. It's, it's the Sea of Reeds. And he goes out there to lead the people as they receive the uh, law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, God's teachings for how to live as God's people. And then... Um, and leads them out into the wilderness on the, their way to the promised land. Well, along this path, Moses, this great leader, his uh, father-in-law, Jethro, shows up with his wife and kids. And they do the family thing. They have the meal together. And then uh, spend time together. And the next day, Moses does what he does, right? He goes off to work. He goes off and, and he sits down and all the people bring their problems to him. And Jethro, his father-in-law, sees this and says, what is this thing that you are doing? This is Exodus 18. Why do you alone sit as judge and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God when they have a dispute, it comes to me and I judge between man and his neighbor and make known the statute of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing you are doing is not good. You will wear out both yourself and the people who are with you, for the task is too heavy. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. You be the people's representative before God. You bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the law and make known to them the way in which they are to walk. Furthermore, you select out of all the people men who fear God, men of truth, and you place them over the others as leaders of the thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them judge. They take care of the small stuff, you take care of the big stuff. And that ends up being Jethro's advice, and, and that's what Jethro does. That's what Moses does. Maybe some of the most practical, wise advice in all of Scripture when it comes to leadership. It is something that Moses once knew that he needed help. 
Once upon a time, when he was standing before a burning bush, he was convinced that he was not up to the task. And uh, so it is only when uh, God offers him the assistance of Aaron, his brother, that he is willing to do this, to go forth and, and to do this great work. Uh, but uh, he had forgotten it. It's the risk of success, right? It's the temptation of success. Now that he has done it, he thinks he can do these great things, and he's not, it just doesn't compute that he was going to need help. He can decide every situation that comes up among the people, and he needs his father-in-law, Jethro, to show up and say, man, you can't do this by yourself. You need help. And so he has to relearn something he had once known and forgotten. And notice how much help he needs. He doesn't just need a little bit of help. Jethro doesn't just say, get the leaders for thousands. He says, get leaders for thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Go the whole nine yards. Get leaders for all the levels of, of society here. But Moses is going to need them. Right? I recently heard a biographer speak about a leader, a great leader, one of the best leaders of our, our the past century, if you, especially when it comes to a certain thing. This leader was amazing at getting things through Congress. You might have guessed who it is. It's a LBJ, right? Another name that you only need three letters, right? Lyndon Johnson, the great senator who became president, who could work with Congress and bend it to his will. And because of his, uh, the way he could bend people to his will, and he, he was pretty crass about it too. He was, uh, I don't know if I necessarily would want, have wanted to drink coffee with him, because he, he would get up in your face, literally. He would kind of scooch next to you and, and lean into you, in a very literal fashion. If he really wanted to mess with you, he'd take you. And uh, he'd be talking to you on his way to the bathroom. They'd go, and he'd go into the bathroom and still be talking to you. And your options were either stay out in the hall and not quite hear him or go on in. And he'd be talking to you. And um, kind of a crass fellow. But he got things done, right? That's why he is so greatly respected, at least when it comes to d domestic policy. He was able to bring to pass the Great Society, the Civil Rights Act, and change the nature of the relationship between Americans and, and it, our government. And, and so I, I was listening to this interview with his, with his biographer, and the reason it was being, he was being questioned is there is this idea that if we just had a great president today, uh, if we just had a great president, someone who could work with Congress, then we would start getting things done in this country again. We'd start getting some forward motion. We'd get some, some progress. Right? And, and this biographer of Lyndon Johnson said, if Lyndon Johnson was president today, even he could not get anything done. Not with this Congress. You see, what he had then was people who were willing to, to follow. He had the leaders of the thousands, the, hundred, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens. He had leaders below him who were willing to work with him and follow his lead. And, and even if he demanded that they follow in ways that were a bit crass, they were willing to follow. And, and we don't have that today. We don't have uh, congressmen who are willing, congressmen and congresswomen who are willing to, to bend and to follow and to be leaders underneath the, the president. And so nothing happens, right? No leader can get anything done unless they also have the leaders of the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens. And it's a temptation to try to do it all yourself. I know, because I have faced that temptation. But, but that's the temptation. We have to resist that. And so we, we learn from the story of Jethro and Moses that if you are leading, you're going to need some help. Might as well ask for it now, because you're going to need more than you need, more than you realize. If you're leading, you're going to need help, and if you're not leading something, offer. Go to people who are leading and say, "What can I do to help you with what you're leading?" Right? If you are leading, you're going to need help, and if you're not leading, go find someone who is leading and offer to help them, for they need the help even if they don't realize it. Now, Jethro is not the only star of the story today. We go from him to another uh, person in Scripture, a leader who is perfect. And I don't mean that with a sense of hyperbole. Joshua, in the Old Testament, uh, he is one of two people in the Bible about whom we have no record uh, of sinning. And the Bible is, is nothing if not honest when it comes to the faults and the sins of the people, the great leaders in it. We it, Just look over the great leaders, the great people in Scripture. Abraham passes his wife off as his sister. 
twice. Uh, David rapes Bathsheba, kills Uriah. Peter denies Christ. Paul watches, watches while Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr. You know, this is just how the Bible works. It is honest about the faults of the great of, of it, the leaders of whom of whom they, it speaks. But there are two people about whom there is nothing reported about them, and they both have the same name. It is by a trick of a. Uh, of translation that we don't realize it's the same name, but the name is Yeshua, and Yeshua uh, in the Old Testament is translated as Joshua, and the New Testament is tra translated as Jesus. And, and I'm not saying that Joshua in the Old Testament it, it is some sort of uh, proto-Christ figure or something like that, but there is a sense in which uh, he is the leader who, who gets it right. Of all the leaders in, in the Old Testament, he's the one who, who gets it right leading people into the promised land and in a way that you could argue is analogous to the way that Jesus leads us to the kingdom of God. So, I mean, there's, there's a connection there. But the point being, Joshua, he nails it. He gets it right. He is the one who has inherited all the, the setup that Moses put together, the, the leaders of the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens. And, and this, this great leader, he's going to lead the people. And does he have it all figured out? I mean, that's what we expect of great leaders, right? We have this idea that leaders, they know where we're at today, and they can say, here's where we're going to be in five years, and here's how we're going to get there, and here's how we're going to pay for it, and here are the problems we're going to have along the way, and here are the things we're going to have to do to fix those problems. Um, we expect our leaders to have this sort of foreknowledge, this almost prophetic ability to see this is exactly where we're going and exactly how we're going to get there. Right? That, that's a, an assumption about leadership. They have leaders. They have everything figured out. They, knew exactly, they know exactly what we need to do. Well, that's not the case with Joshua. He's the best leader you can find in all of the Old Testament. And what does he have to go on? Well, he was one of the 12 spies back 40 years prior who went into the promised land to, see, to scout it out, and then they come out, and Moses sends 12 spies in, they scout the promised land, they come out, and two of them, Joshua and, and Caleb, say we should go in and take the promised land. The other 10 say, we'll get whooped. Don't. And, and so the 10, they convince all the Hebrew people that they shouldn't, and so they then spend 40 years wandering in the desert, uh, learning to trust God, before then they, the, they go back into the promised land. And so Joshua has been where they're going once, 40 years ago. Think about a trip that you took 40 years ago. And how much do you remember? 40 years ago, right? Could you lead an entire people on a trip that you took 40 years ago? And, and let's not even think about how much things could have changed in 40 years. How much, I mean, but 40 years, huge difference. So. Joshua does not have it all figured out. He does not have uh, the entire path worked out. He does not know what the surprises are. What Joshua has is, is solid leaders beneath him, the leaders of the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens. He trusts that God will walk with them, and he knows they're pointed in the right direction. That's what he's got. And that's what makes him a great leader. Good people following him, solid leaders following him. He knows that God is he knows that God is with them and they're pointed in the right direction. That is the best that can be expected of a leader. Right? That's it. That is leadership at its finest. As I think about Joshua and what he's willing to do, he knows he's going in the right direction, and here we go, charge. I, I think of uh, I'm reminded of the way that the American military trains its, its officers. If you think about uh, the, what happens when we're training officers, it, I don't know if you've come across the term the fog of war. It's the idea that no one ever knows everything going on in a battlefield. You don't know where the other side is. You don't know if there's an airstrike coming in. You don't know exactly where your supply train is. You don't know. There, it, it's, the list of things you don't know will always be longer than the list of things you do know. And if you wait to know everything you want to know, you will be paralyzed. You will never do anything. And so our second lieutenants in the American military are trained to make decisions. You don't know everything you want to know? Tough. Make a decision and go. Make a decision. That, that's what they're trained to do. And then the enlisted men and women are trained to follow that decision. And, and so that, that's the lesson of Joshua, right? You don't know everything in front of you, but you decide and you move out anyways. Because you'll never know everything. But great leaders make decisions and go ahead even when uh, not, 
everything isn't perfectly clear. All right. And and so no, that's, that's the great lesson of Joshua. You decide and you go, even though it's not figured out. And, and that is something I've seen again and again when it comes to, to my life. You never know everything when, that's going to happen when you're in a leadership position. And anyone who stands up there and says, I have it all figured out, how we're going to get from here to there, and it, it's all just going to come together cleanly. Anyone who says it's all worked out, and they know how everything's going to unfold, is lying. They are lying. Because no one has that all figured out. I have been in leadership positions since I was 17. One day, maybe I'll be good at it. But uh, the first thing I did, 17, I was running an Eagle Scout project. All I had to do, this sounds simple, is move two uh, shelters, two handicapped accessible hunting blinds. They had full roofs and, and, and a long ramp that came up to this full shelter. It was probably maybe eight by eight. Um, and, and then with short uh, walls so that you could look out over it and shoot at the, the deer. And they had to be moved to uh, where they were going to be used. They'd been built, but they needed to be moved out there. And so I had two to move, two weekends, 20 kids, 20 boys. Uh, I had big rope, pulleys, and a few adult leaders. I'm great. So I go out there the first weekend, and the things are so heavy and so overbuilt and so solid that we get all those ropes on and we're like lined up and it's, it's like we're all trying to pull the thing and we have like 10 kids on, on each of the two ropes trying to pull this on, up onto the trailer and the sucker is just, it's not going. It's not going anywhere. And so uh, it, it just doesn't work. And so I have, I have till next weekend, and we got to do it again next weekend, and we got to move, and we got to move these things, and I don't think we can move them with the pulleys. And so I have a week to figure out what I need, a bobcat, find a bobcat, find someone to drive the bobcat, and, and make sure it's, it, I can bring the bobcat in, and, and then there's some liability issues. I mean, am I covered by insurance? If, I mean, just all these things have got to be figured out, and I have one week to figure it out, and thank God it does get figured out, but you think it's going to work out one way, you're wrong. I mean, I moved on to run jazz festivals over at Truman, and... Um, and I had a jazz vessel running, 42 bands, all the schedule clicking along. And then someone pulls the fire alarm in the building and the entire schedule goes out the window. I mean, these things happen. And it always happens when you're leading something. Always. The surprise is when there isn't a surprise. So, uh, leaders. We look at leadership in the Bible. It is not the great man approach to leadership. There aren't any of these like, great men that have it all figured out. Even the greatest, the one person you could call great, Joshua, even he, he doesn't have it all figured out. We look at leadership in the Bible, and, and here's what we can figure out just looking at these two situations today, Jethro, Moses, and Joshua. First, with Jethro and Moses, if you're leading, you need help. And so if we're going to do anything together as a church, those who are leading us need help. And so we who are not leading need to offer it. And second, uh, Joshua, the lesson of Joshua. Leadership at its best goes the right direction and is willing to make decisions to move in that right direction even if the path isn't clear, even if we don't have everything figured out along the way. All right? We cannot expect our leaders to have it all figured out. What we can expect is to point in the right direction and, and trust that as we follow uh, Jesus together, everything can be worked out one step at a time. Next Sunday, we will turn to look at uh, two more leaders in the, the Bible, uh, Elisha and, and Paul, and, and the way that uh, we can understand how leaders fail. But I just want you to leave you this idea uh, today, that uh, leadership in, in Scripture, as we look at leadership in the church, um, it's not about having it all figured out. It's about pointing in the right direction, following Jesus, and uh, being willing to take the next step regardless of whether we have it all figured out or not. Amen.